Good evening, and welcome to Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's installment provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep for once. So lie back, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath, and off we go. In honor of the new year, this evening we're talking about time. We're reading Time and Clocks, a description of ancient and modern methods of measuring time by H. H. Cunningham, M.A. C.B. M.I.E.E. -E, with many illustrations. London, Archibald Constable & Co. Limited, 16 James Street, Haymarket, 1906. Let's begin. Time and Clocks, an introduction. When we read the works of Homer or Virgil or Plato, or turn to the later productions of Dante, of Shakespeare, of Milton, and the host of writers and poets who have done so much to instruct and amuse us and to make our lives good and agreeable, we are apt to look with some disappointment upon present times. And when we turn to the field of art and compare Greek statues and Gothic or Renaissance architecture with our modern efforts, we must feel bound to admit our inferiority to our ancestors. And this leads us perhaps to question whether our age is the equal of those which have gone before, or whether the human intellect is not on the decline. This feeling, however, proceeds from a failure to remember that each age of the world has its peculiar points of strength as well as of weakness. During one period, that self-denying patriotism and zeal for the common good will be developing, which is necessary for the formation of society. During another, the study of the principles of morality and religion will be in the ascendant. During another, the arts will take the lead. During another, poetry, tragedy, and lyric poetry and prose will be cultivated. During another, music will take its turn, and out of rude peasant songs will evolve the harmony of the opera. To our age is reserved the glory of being easily the foremost in scientific discovery. Future ages may despise our literature, surpass us in poetry, complain that in philosophy we have done nothing, and even deride and forget our music but they will only be able to look back with admiration on the band of scientific thinkers who in the 17th century reduced to a system the laws that govern the motions of worlds, no less than those of atoms, and who in the 18th and 19th founded the sciences of chemistry, electricity, sound, heat, light, and who gave to mankind the steam engine, the telegraph, railways, the methods of making huge structures of iron, the dynamo, the telephone, and the thousand applications of science to the service of man. And future students of history, who shall be familiar with the conditions of our life, will, I think, be also struck with surprise at our estimate of our own peculiar capabilities and faculties. They will note with astonishment that a gentleman of the 19th century, an age mighty in science and by no means preeminent in art, literature, and philosophy, should have considered it disgraceful to be ignorant of the accent with which a Greek or a Roman thought fit to pronounce a word, should have been ashamed to be unable to construe a Latin aphorism, and yet should have considered it no shame at all not to know how a telephone was made and why it worked. They will smile when they observe that our highest university degrees, our most lucrative rewards, were given for the study of dead languages or archaeological investigations, and that science, our glory and that for which we have shown real ability, should only have occupied a secondary place in our education. They will smile when they learn that we considered that a knowledge of public affairs could only be acquired by a grounding in Greek particles, 
or that it could ever have been thought that men could not command an army without a study of the tactics employed at the Battle of Marathon. But the battle between classical and scientific education is not in reality so much a dispute regarding subjects to be taught as between methods of teaching. It is possible to teach classics so that they become a mental training of the highest value. It is possible to teach science so that it becomes a mere enslaving routine. The one great requirement for the education of the future is firmly to grasp the fact that a study of words is not a study of things, and that a man cannot become a carpenter merely by learning the names of his tools. It was the mistake of the teachers of the Middle Ages to believe that the first step in knowledge was to get a correct set of concepts of all things, and then to deduce or bring out all knowledge from them. Admirable plan, if you can get your concepts. But unfortunately, concepts do not exist ready-made. They must be grown. And as your knowledge increases, so do your concepts change. A concept of a thing is not a mere definition, it is a complete history of it. And you must build up your edifice of scientific knowledge from the earth, brick by brick and stone by stone. There is no magic process by which it can, with a word, be conjured into existence like a palace in the Arabian Nights. For nothing is more fatal than a juggle with words such as force, weight, attraction, mass, time, space, capacity, or gravity. Words are like purses. They contain only as much money as you put into them. You may jingle your bag of pennies till they sound like sovereigns, and when you come to pay your bills, the difference is soon discovered. This fatal practice of learning words without trying to obtain a clear comprehension of their meaning causes many teachers to use mathematical formulae not as mere steps in a logical chain, but like magical cauldrons into which they put the premises as the witches put herbs and babies' thumbs into their pots, and expect the answers to rise like apparitions by some occult process that they cannot explain. This tendency is encouraged by foolish parents, who like to see their infant prodigies appear to understand things too hard for themselves, and look on at their children's lessons in mathematics, like rustics gaping at a fair. They forget that for the practical purposes of life, one thing well understood is worth a whole book full of muddled, ill-digested formulae. Unfortunately, it is possible to cram boys up and run them through the examination sieves with the appearance of knowledge without its reality. If it were cricket or golf that were being tested, how soon would the fraud be discovered? No humbug would be permitted in those interesting and absorbing subjects. And really, when one reflects how easy it is to present the appearance of book knowledge without the reality, one can hardly blame those who select men for service in India and Egypt a good deal for their proficiency in sports and games. Better a good cricketer than a silly pedant stuffed full of learning that lies like marl upon a barren soil, encumbering what is not in its power to fertilize. Another kindred error is to expect too much of science. For with all our efforts to obtain a further knowledge of the mysteries of nature, we are only like travelers in a forest. The deeper we penetrate it, the darker becomes the shade. For science is but an exchange of ignorance for that which is another kind of ignorance. And all our analysis of incomprehensible things leads us only to things more incomprehensible still. It is therefore by the firm resolution never to juggle with words or ideas, or to try and persuade ourselves or others that we understand what we do not understand, that any scientific advance can be made. Chapter 1 All students of any subject are at first apt to be perplexed by the number and complication of the new ideas presented to them. 
the need of comprehending these ideas is felt, and yet they are difficult to grasp and to define. Thus, for instance, we are all apt to think we know what is meant when force, weight, length, capacity, motion, rest, size are spoken of. And yet, when we come to examine these ideas more closely, we find that we know very little about them. Indeed, the more elementary they are, the less we are able to understand them. The most primordial of our ideas seem to be those of number and quantity. We can count things, and we can measure them, or compare them with one another. Arithmetic is the science which deals with the number of things and enables us to multiply and divide them. The estimation of quantities is made by the application of our faculty of comparison to different subjects. The ideas of number and quantity appear to pervade all our conceptions. The study of natural phenomena of the world around us is called the study of physics. From the Greek word for inanimate nature, the term physics is usually confined to such part of nature as is not alive. The study of living things is usually termed biology, from bio, life. In the study of natural phenomena, there are, however, three ideas which occupy a peculiar and important position, because they may be used as the means of measuring or estimating all the rest. In this sense, they seem to be the most primitive and fundamental that we possess. We are not entitled to say that all other ideas are formed from and compounded of these ideas, but we are entitled to say that our correct understanding of physics, that is, of the study of nature, depends in no slight degree upon our clear understanding of them. The three fundamental ideas are those of space, time, and mass. Space appears to be the universal accompaniment of all our impressions of the world around us. Try as we may, we cannot think of material bodies except in space and occupying space. Though we can imagine space as empty, we cannot conceive it as destroyed. And this space has three dimensions. Length, breadth, measured across or at right angles to length and thickness measured at right angles to length and breadth. More dimensions than this we cannot have. For some inscrutable reason it has been arranged that space shall present these three dimensions and no more. A fourth dimension is to us unimaginable, I will not say inconceivable. We can conceive that a world might be with space in four dimensions but we cannot imagine it to ourselves, or think what things would be like in it. With difficulty, we can perhaps imagine a world of space with only two dimensions, a flat land where flat beings of different shapes, like figures cut out of paper, slide or float about on a flat table. They could not hop over one another, for they would only have length and breadth. To hop up, you would want to be able to move in a third dimension. But having two dimensions only, you could only slide forward and sideways in a plane. To such beings, a ring would be a box. You would have to break the ring to get anything out of it. For if you tried to slide out, you would be met by a wall in every direction. You could not jump out of it like a sheep would jump out of a pen over the hurdles for to jump would require a third dimension, which you have not got. Beings in a world with one dimension only would be in a worse plight still. Like beads on a string, they could slide about in one direction as far as the others would let them, but they could not pass one another. To such a being, two other beings would be a box one on each side of him, for if thus imprisoned, he could not get away. Like a wagon on a railway, he could not walk around another wagon. That would want power of moving in two dimensions. Still less could he jump over them. That would want three. 
We have not the smallest idea why our world has been thus limited. Some philosophers think that the limitation is in us, not in the world, and that perhaps when our minds are free from the limitations imposed by their sojourn in our bodies, and death has set us free, we may see not only what is the length and breadth and height, but a great deal more also, of which we can now form no conception. But these speculations lead us out of science into the shadowy land of metaphysics, of which we long to know something, but are condemned to know so little. Area is got by multiplying length by breadth. Cubic content is got by multiplying length by breadth and by height. Of all the conceptions respecting space, that of a line is the simplest. It has direction and length. The idea of mass is more difficult to grasp than that of space. It means quantity of matter. But what is matter? That we do not know. It is not weight, though it is true that all matter has weight. Yet matter would still have mass, even if its property of weight were taken away. For consider such a thing as a pound packet of tea. It has size, it occupies space, it has length, breadth, and thickness. It has also weight. But what gives it weight? The attraction of the earth. Suppose you double the size of the earth. The earth being bigger would attract the package of tea more strongly. The weight of the tea, that is, the attraction of the earth on the package of tea would be increased. The tea would weigh more than before. Take the package of tea to the planet Jupiter, which, being very large, has an attraction at the surface two and one-half times that of the earth. Its size would be the same, but it would feel to carry like a package of sand. Yet there would be the same mass of tea, you could make no more cups of tea out of it in Jupiter than on Earth. Take it to the moon, and it would weigh a little over two ounces. But still, it would be a pound of tea. We are in the habit of estimating mass by its weight, and we do so rightly, for at any place on the Earth, as London, the weights of masses are always proportioned to the masses. And if you want to find out what mass of tea you have got, you weigh it, and you know for certain. Hence, in our minds, we confuse mass with weight. And even in our acts of parliament, we have done the same thing, so that it is difficult to the statuses respecting standard weights to know what was meant by those who drew them up, and whether a pound of tea means the mass of a certain amount of tea or the weight of that mass. For accurate thinking, we must, of course, always deal with masses, not with weights. For so far as we can tell, mass appears indestructible. A mass is a mass wherever it is, and for all time, whereas its weight varies with the attractive force of the planet upon which it happens to be, and with its distance from the planet's center. A flea on this earth can skip perhaps eight inches high. Put that flea on the moon, and with the expenditure of the same energy, he could skip four feet high. Put him on the planet Jupiter, and he could only skip three and one-fifth inches high. A man in a street in the moon could jump up into a window on the first floor of a house. One pound of tea taken to the sun would be as heavy as 28 pounds of it at the Earth's surface, and weight varies at different parts of the Earth. Hence the true measure of quantity of matter is mass, not weight. The mass of bodies varies according to their size. If you have the same nature of material, then for a double size, you have a double mass. Some bodies are more concentrated than others, that is to say, more dense. It is as though they were more tightly squeezed together. 
Thus, a ball of lead of an inch in diameter contains 48 times as much mass as a ball of cork an inch in diameter. In order to know the weight of a certain mass of matter, we should have to multiply the mass by a figure representing the attractive force or pull of the earth. In physics, it is usual to employ the letters of the alphabet as a sort of shorthand to represent words, so that the letter M stands for the mass of a body. So again, G stands for the attractive pull of the earth at a given place. W stands for the weight of the body. Hence then, since the weight of a body depends on its mass and also on the attractive pull of the earth, we express this in short language by saying W equals M times G, or W is equal to M multiplied by G. The symbol equals being used for equality, and X the sign of multiplication. In common use, X is usually omitted, and when letters are put together, they are intended to be understood as multiplied, so that this is written W equals MG. Of course, by this equation, we do not mean that weight is mass multiplied into the force of gravity. We only mean that the number of units of weight is to be found by multiplying the number of units of mass into the number of units of the Earth's force of gravity. In the same way, if, when estimating the number of wagons, W, that would be wanted for an army of men, N, which consumed a number of pounds, P, of provisions a day, we might put W equals NP. But this would not mean that we were multiplying soldiers into food to produce wagons, but only that we were performing a numerical calculation. Time is one of the most mysterious of our elementary ideas. It seems to exist or not to exist, according as we are thinking or not thinking. It seems to run or stand still and to go fast or slowly. How it drags through a wearisome lesson. How it flies during a game of cricket. How it seems to stop in sleep. If we measured time by our own thoughts, it would be a very uncertain quantity. But other considerations seem to show us that nature knows no such uncertainty as regards time, that she produces her phenomena in a uniform manner in uniform times, and that time has an existence independent of our thoughts and wills. The idea of a state of things in which time existed no more was quite familiar to medieval thinkers, and was regarded by many of them as the condition that would exist after the Day of Judgment. In recent times, Kant propounded the theory that time was only a necessary condition of our thoughts, and had no existence apart from thinking beings. In fact, that it was our way of looking at things. Scientifically, however, we are warranted in treating time as perfectly real and capable of the most exact measurement. For example, if we arrange a stream of sand to run out of an orifice and observe how much will run out while an egg is being boiled, we find as a fact that if the same quantity of sand runs out, the state of the egg is uniform. If we walk for an hour by a watch, we find that we can go half the distance that we should if we walked two hours. It is the correspondence of these various experiments that gives us faith in the treatment of time as a thing existing independently of ourselves, or, at all events, independent of our transient moods. The idea of time, acquired by the races of men that first evolved from a state of barbarism, were no doubt derived from the observation of day and night, the month and the year. For suppose that a shepherd were on the plains of Chaldea, or perhaps on those mountains of India known as the roof of the world, 
which according to some archaeologists was the site of the Garden of Eden and the early home of the European race. What would he see? He would see the sun rise in the east, slowly mount the heavens till it stood over the south at middle day. Then it would sink towards the west and disappear. In summer, the rising point of the sun would be more to the northward than in winter, and so also would be its point of setting. In winter, it would rise a little to the south of east, and set a little to the south of west, and not rise so high in the heavens at midday, so that the summer day would be longer than the winter day. If the day were always divided into twelve hours, whether it were long or short, then in summer the hours of the day would be long, in winter they would be short. This mode of dividing the day was that used by the Greeks. The Egyptians, on the other hand, averaged their day by dividing the whole round of the sun into 24 hours, so that the summer day contained more hours than the winter day. Hence, for the Egyptians, sunrise did not always take place at six o'clock, for in winter it took place after six, and in summer before six, and this is the system that has descended to us. The moon would also rise in different places, but these would be independent of those at which the sun rose and set. Moreover, the moon each day would appear to get further and further away from the sun in the direction of the arrow as shown in the sketch. If the moon rose an hour after the sun on one day, the next day it would rise more than two hours after the sun, and so on. This delay in rising of the moon would go on day by day, till at last she came right round to the sun again, as shown in the sketch. And in her path, she would change her form from a crescent up to a full moon, when she would be halfway round from the sun. That is, when she would rise twelve hours after him, or just be rising as the sun set. This delay and accompanying change of form would go on, till after three weeks she would have got round to the starting position, when she would rise eighteen hours after the sun, and have become a crescent with her back to the sun. In fact, she would always turn her convex side to the sun. At length, when twenty-eight days had passed, she would be round again about opposite to the sun, and consequently her pale light would be extinguished in his beams, and she would gradually reappear as a new moon on the other side of him. This series of changes of the moon takes place once every twenty-eight days, and is called a lunar or moon month and was used as a division of time by very early nations. The changes of the seasons recurred with the changes in the times of rising of the sun, and took a year to bring about. And there were nearly thirteen moon changes in a year. It was also observed that during its cycle of changes, the sun was slowly moving round backwards among the stars in the same direction as the moon only it made its retrograde cycle in a year, and thus arose the division of time into months and years. The stars turned round in the heavens once in the complete day. The sun, therefore, appeared to move back among them, passing successively through groups of stars, so as to make the circuit of them all in a year. The stars through which he passed in a year and through which the moon traveled in a month, were divided by the ancients into groups called constellations, and its yearly path in the heavens was called the zodiac. There were twelve of these constellations in the zodiac, called the signs. Hence, then, the sun passed through a sign in every month, making the tour of them all in the year. To these signs, fanciful names were given, such as the ram, 
the water bearer, the virgin, the scorpion, and so on. And the sun and moon were then said to pass through the signs of the zodiac. Hence, since the path of the sun marked the year, you could tell the seasons by knowing what sign of the zodiac the sun was in. The age of the moon was easily known by her form. When the winter was over then, just as the sun set, the dog star would be rising in the east, and this would show that the spring was at hand. Then the peasants prepared to till the earth and sow the seed and lead the oxen out to pasture and celebrated with joyful mirth the glad advent of the spring, corresponding to our Easter, when the sun had run through three constellations of the zodiac. Then came the summer heat, and with many a mystic rite they celebrated Midsummer's Day. In autumn, after three more signs of the zodiac have been traversed by the sun, the sun again rises exactly in the east and sets in the west and the days and nights are equal. This is the autumnal equinox, and was once celebrated by the feast, which we now know as Michaelmas Day, and the goose is the remnant of that ancient festival. And the great winter feast of the ancients is now known to us as Christmas, and chosen to celebrate the birth of our Lord. For when Christianity came into the world and the heathens were converted, the old feast days were deliberately changed into Christian festivals. To us, therefore, the whole heavens and the fixed stars with them appear to turn from east to west, or from left to right as we look towards the south, as shown by the big arrow in the sketch. But the moon and sun, though apparently placed in the heavens, move backwards among the fixed stars as shown by the small arrows. The sun moves at such a rate that he goes round the circle of the heavens in a year of 365 days. The moon goes round the circle in 28 and a half days, or a lunar month. Of course, in reality, the sun is at rest, and it is the earth that moves round the sun and spins on its axis as it moves. But it will presently be shown that the appearance to a person on the earth is the same whether the earth goes round the sun or the sun goes round the earth. From the works of Greek writers, we know a good deal about the ideas of the world that were entertained by the ancients. The most early notions were, of course, connected with the worship of the gods. The sun was considered as a huge light carried in a chariot driven by Apollo with four spirited steeds. It descended to the ocean when the day declined, and then the horses were unyoked by the nymphs of the ocean and led round to the east, so as to be ready for the journey of the following day. The Egyptians figured the sun as placed in a boat, which sailed over the heavens. At night the sun god descended into the infernal regions, carrying with him the souls of those who had died during the day. There they passed through different regions of hell, with portals guarded by hideous monsters. Those who had well learned the ritual of the dead knew the words of power wherewith to appease the demons. Those unprovided with the watchwords were subjected to terrible dangers. Then the soul appeared before Minos, and was weighed and dealt with according to its deserts. The earth was considered as a huge island in the midst of a circular sea. Gradually, however, astronomical ideas became subjected to science. One of the first truths that dawned on astronomers was the fact that the earth was a sphere. For they noticed that as people went further and further to the north, the elevation of the sun at midday above the horizon became smaller and smaller. This can easily be seen from the diagram above. When an observer is at point A, the sun appears at an altitude above the horizon equal to the angle alpha. 
But as he goes along the curved surface of the Earth to a point B, nearer to the North Pole, the sun appears to be lower and only to have an altitude beta. From this, it was easy for men so skilled in geometry as the Greeks to calculate how big the Earth was. They did so, and it appeared to have the enormous diameter of 8,000 miles. They only knew quite a small portion of it. They thought that the rest was ocean. But they had, of course, a clear idea of the antipodes, or upside-down side of it, and they believed that if men were on the other side of it, that their feet must all point towards its center. From this, they got the idea of the center of the earth as a point of attraction for all things that had an earth-seeking or earthly nature. Fire appeared always to desire to go upwards, so they thought that fire had an earth-repellent, heaven-seeking character. Water they thought partly earth-seeking, partly heaven-seeking, for it appeared in the ocean or floated as clouds. Air they thought to be indifferent. And out of the four elements, fire, water, earth, and air, they believed the world was made. The earth, they thought, must be at rest, for if it was in motion, things would fly off from it. They saw that either the sun must be moving around the earth, or else the earth must be turning on its axis. They chose the former hypothesis, because they argued that if the earth was twisting around once in 24 hours, then such a country as Greece must be flying round like a spot on the surface of a top, at the rate of about 18,000 miles in 24 hours. That is, at the rate of about 180 yards in a second, or faster than an arrow from a bow. But if that was the case, then a bird that flew up from the earth would be left far behind. If a ball were thrown up, it would fall hundreds of yards behind the person who threw it. They could not conceive how it was possible for a ball thrown up by someone standing on a moving object not to fall behind the thrower. This decided them in their error. The mistaken astronomy of the Greeks was also much forwarded by Aristotle, the tutor of Alexander the Great this great genius in politics and philosophy was only in the second rank as a man of science, and, as I think, hardly equal to Archimedes or Hipparchus, or even to Ptolemy. Aristotle wrote a book concerning the heavens which bristles with the most wantonly erroneous scientific ideas, such as, for instance, that the motion of the heavenly bodies must be circular, because the most perfect curve is a circle, and similar assumptions as to the course of nature. The earth, then, being fixed, they thought that the moon, the sun, and the seven planets were carried round it, fixed each of them in an enormous crystal spherical shell. These spheres, like coats of an onion, slid round one upon another, each carrying his celestial luminary. The moon was the nearest, then Mercury, then Venus, then the sun, then Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Outside them was the sphere of the stars, and outside all, the primum mobile, or great prime mover of the universe. When one of the celestial bodies, such as the moon, got in front of another, such as the sun, there was an eclipse. They soon observed that the moon derived its light from the sun. As they knew the size of the earth, by comparison, they got some vague idea of the huge distances that the heavenly bodies must be from us. In fact, they measured the distance of the moon with approximate accuracy, making it 240,000 miles, or about 30 times the Earth's diameter. 
This, of course, gave them the moon's diameter, for they were easily able to calculate how big an object must be that looks as big as the moon and is 240,000 miles away. This large size of the moon gave them some idea of the distance of the sun, but they failed to realize how big and how far away he really is. Several ancient nations used weeks as means of measuring time. They made four weeks to the lunar month. The order of the days was rather curiously arranged, for assuming that the Earth is the center of the planetary system, put the planets in a column, putting the nearest, the moon, at the bottom and the furthest off at the top. Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, the Sun, Venus, Mercury, the Moon. Then divide the day into three watches of eight hours each, and let each watch be presided over by one of the planet gods. Begin with Saturn. We then have Saturn as the first god ruling Saturday, and Jupiter and Mars the two other gods for that day. The first watch for Sunday will be the Sun. Venus and Mercury will preside over the next two watches of that day. The planet that will preside over the first watch of the next day will be the Moon, and the day will therefore be called Monday. Saturn and Jupiter will be the other gods for Monday. The first watch of the next day Will be presided over by Mars, and the day will therefore be called Mars Day, or Mardi, or in the Teutonic languages, Tuesday, after Tusco, a Scandinavian god of war. Mercury will give a name to Mercredi, or to Wednesday, or Woden's Day, Jupiter to Jeudi, or Thursday, Venus to Vendredi, or in the Scandinavian Friday, the day of the Scandinavian goddess Freya, the goddess of love and beauty who corresponds to Venus, and thus the week is completed. This weekly scheme came probably from the Chaldean astronomers. It appears probable that the great Tower of Babel, the ruins of which exist to this day, consisted of seven stages, one over the other, the top one painted white, or perhaps purple, to represent the moon, the next lower one blue for Mercury, and then green for Venus, yellow for the Sun, red for Mars, orange for Jupiter, and black for Saturn. Unfortunately, of the colors, no trace now remains. But nightly, on the long terraces, the Babylonian priests observed eclipses and other celestial phenomena. Their records were afterwards taken to Alexandria and kept in the great library that was subsequently burned by the Turks. In that library, they were seen by the astronomer Ptolemy, who used them in the writing of his work on astronomy called the Great Syntaxis, or Collection. The original work perished, but it had been translated into Arabic by the Arab astronomers, who called it Almagest, the Great Book. It was translated from Arabic into Latin, and remains the textbook for astronomers in Europe quite down to the time of Queen Elizabeth, when a better system took its place. For the use of men engaged in practical astronomy, it is very convenient to consider the sun, moon, stars, and planets as going round the earth at rest. For instance, seamen use the heavenly bodies as, in a way, hands of a huge clock, from which they can know the time and their positions on the earth. The nautical almanac, which is printed yearly, gives the true position of these heavenly bodies for every hour, minute, and second of the year and I will presently show how useful this is to sailors. We will deal with the sun first. From the motions of the sun, we can observe the time. 
This is done in every garden by means of sundials, and I will now describe how they are constructed. If a light, such as the light of a candle, be moved round in a circle at a uniform pace, so as to go round once in some given period, such as 24 hours, it is obvious that it would serve to measure time. Thus, for example, if a sheet of white paper be placed upon the table, and a pencil be stuck onto it upright with some sealing wax, or a pen propped up in an ink pot, then a candle held by anyone will cast the shadow of the pen on the paper. If the person holding the candle walk round the table at a uniform speed, the shadow will go round like the hands of a clock, and might be made to mark the time. If the candle took 24 hours to go round the table, as the sun takes 24 hours to go round the earth, then marks placed on the paper would serve to measure the hours, and the paper and pen would serve as a sort of sundial. But the sun does not go round the earth as the candle round the table. Its path is an inclined one, like that shown by the dotted line in the figure. Sometimes it is above the level of the table, sometimes below it, and moreover, its winter path is different from its summer path. Whence then it follows that the hour marks on the paper cannot be put equidistant like the hours of the dial of a clock, and that some arrangement must be made so that the line as shown by the summer sun shall correspond with the time as shown by the winter sun. It is evident that for a person living on the North Pole, a sundial would be an easy thing to make. All that would be needful would be to put a post vertically in the ground and observe its shadow as the sun went round. In latitudes such as that of England, where the pole of the earth is inclined at an angle to the horizon, it is necessary that the rod, or style as it is called, of the sundial should be inclined to the horizontal. For if we used an upright style, then when the sun was in the south at midday, the shadow would lie along the same direction, whether the sun were high in summer or low in winter. But at the other hours, such as nine o'clock in the morning, the shadow of the style would, when the sun was at its summer position, lie along one line whereas when the sun was at its winter position, the shadow would lie along another. Thus the time would appear different in summer and in winter, and the dial would lead to errors. But if the style is inclined in the direction of the poles, then, however, the sun moves from or towards the pole. As its position varies in winter and summer, the shadow still remains unchanged for any particular hour and it is only the circular motion of the sun round in its daily path that affects the position of the shadows. Therefore, the first condition of making a sundial is that the style which casts the shadow should be parallel to the Earth's axis, that is to say, should point to the polar star. This is the case whether the sundial is horizontal or is vertical, and whether it stands on a pillar in the garden, or is attached to the wall of a house. To divide the dial, we have only to imagine it surrounded by a sort of cage, formed of twenty-four arcs, drawn from the North Pole to the South Pole, and equidistant from one another. In its course, the sun would cross one of them every hour. Hence the points to which the shadows of the inclined style would point are the points where these arcs meet the horizontal circle. This consideration leads to a simple method of constructing a sundial, which is given at the end of this chapter in an appendix. Sundials were largely in use in ancient times. It is thought that the circular row of stones used by the druids were used to mark the sun's path and indicate the times and seasons. Obelisks are also supposed to have been used to cast sun shadows. 
the Greeks were perfectly acquainted with the method of making sundials with inclined styles or gnomons. Small portable sundials were once much used before the introduction of watches and were provided with compasses by which they could be turned round so that the style pointed to the north. Sundials were only available during the hours of the day when the sun was shining. The desire to mark the hours of the night led to the adoption of water clocks, which measured time by the amount of water which escaped from a small hole in a level of water. Some care, however, is required to secure correct registration. For suppose that we have a vessel with a small pipe leading out near the bottom, then the amount of water which will run out of the pipe in a given time depends upon the pressure of the water at the pipe, and this depends in its turn upon the head of water in the vessel. Whence it follows that the division due to, say, an hour's run of the clock will be more than the division corresponding to an hour at a point lower down, and hence the divisions marked on the vessel to show the hours by means of the level of the water would be uneven, becoming smaller and smaller as the water fell in the vessel. To avoid the inconvenience of unequal divisions, the water to be measured was allowed to escape into an empty vessel from a vessel in which its surface was always kept at a constant level. Inasmuch as the pressure on the pipe or orifice in the vessel in which the water was always kept at a constant level was always constant, it followed that equal volumes of water indicated equal times, and the vessel into which the water fell needed only to be equally divided. As a measure of hours of the day in countries such as Egypt, where the hours were always equal, and thus where the longer days contained more hours. The water clock was very suitable, but in Greece and Rome, where the day, whatever its length, was always divided into twelve hours, the simple water clock was as unsuitable as a modern clock would be, for it always divided the hours equally, and took no account of the fact that by such a system the hours in summer were longer than in winter. In order, therefore, to make the water clock available in Greece and Italy, it became necessary to make the hours unequal, and to arrange them to correspond with unequal hours of the Greek day. This plan was accomplished as follows. Upon the water which was poured into the vessel that measured the hours was placed a float, and on the float stood a figure made of thin copper with a wand in its hand. This wand pointed to an unequally divided scale. A separate scale was provided for every day in the year, and these scales were mounted on a drum which revolved so as to turn round once in a year. Thus, as the figure rose each day by means of a cogwheel, it moved the drum round one division or one three hundred and sixty-fifth part of a revolution. By this means, the scale corresponding to any particular day of winter or summer was brought opposite the wand of the figure, and thus the scale of hours was kept true. In fact, the water clock which kept true time was made by artificial means to keep untrue time in order to correspond with the unequal hours of the Greek days. In the picture, A is the receiving water vessel, P the pipe through which the water flows, B is the figure, C the rod, D is the drum made to revolve by the cogwheel E, containing 365 teeth, of which one tooth was driven forward at the close of each day. A siphon, G, was fixed in the vessel, A, so that when the figure had risen to the top and pushed forward the lever, F, the siphon suddenly emptied the vessel through the pipe, H, and the figure fell to the bottom of the vessel, A, and became ready to rise and register another day. 
The divisions on the drum are, of course, uneven. On one side, corresponding to the summer, the day hours would reckon about 70 minutes each. The night hours would be only about 50 minutes each, so that the day divisions on the scale would be long and the night divisions short. The reverse would be the case in winter, and therefore the lines around the drum would go in an uneven, wavy form. Such water clocks as these were used by the ancient Romans. Well, I think we'll stop there with Time and Clocks, a description of ancient and modern methods of measuring time. Hopefully, you're no longer awake to hear this anyway, but if you are, and you'd like something else to do besides counting the hours, won't you consider leaving us a positive review on iTunes? It's very helpful. If you'd like to read more from this book yourself, we've set up a Goodreads account for Boring Books for Bedtime that includes a library of everything we've read to date. Just go to goodreads.com and search for Boring Books for Bedtime. If you'd like to connect or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, catch us on Twitter at Boring Books Pod or on patreon.com where you'll also find a number of perks exclusive to supporters. I'd like to wish you a very happy new year. Thank you so much for listening. Until our next boring book, good night.